Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Is a best friend better than a husband or is it the other way around? Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy it! The sun had barely risen when I opened my eyes to a day that filled me with horror. Nothing could happen today that would hurt me too much, but if things didn't go the way I wanted, it might steal the icing off my cake. As I started to get up, she woke up too and reached for my hand, placing it back on her very pregnant belly. Let those mans wait, she said, snuggling even closer to me. It doesn't matter to me at all. They don't matter, the law doesn't matter, and society doesn't matter. Only the three of us are important. All that matters is you, me, and our child, so hold me a little longer. Then we'll go and throw our pearls before the pigs. I shrugged, a gesture lost in the dim light, and pulled her closer to me. We made love. Later, after showering together, we sat down to breakfast. She grabbed my hand. Barry, we don't really have to go, she said thoughtfully. What we have is enough. This is much more than I ever hoped for and a thousand times better than what I had. I simply nodded. But we still have to try, I said. I'll bring the car. I must be the biggest idiot on the planet, I thought. I was really happy. I wouldn't trade my life for anything, regardless of its parameters. Let me explain what just happened, and you'll see what I mean. I'm single, that is, divorced. I just woke up and had breakfast with the pregnant wife of the man who was once my best friend. He considered himself my friend up until the moment I left with her about 18 months ago. The child growing in her belly is, of course, mine. She wasn't pregnant when we left, and I wasn't completely divorced then. Her husband, Jay, would probably take her back in a heartbeat even now. I think it would have been good for him to have her around even after we ran away together, since he's paraplegic and wheelchair-bound. He seemed to really love her, always telling everyone how beautiful she was. I guess the fool thought they'd grow old together and all that. It's funny, in a way. This is what made Aubrey and I so nervous. We're going to visit Jay today to accept our fate and clear things up. I guess it's a bit of closure. Jay is the last person we need to meet. Both our families, hers and mine, have been coming to terms with our relationship for a year and a half. Her parents began to respect and even love me, although they'd prefer that we were married, and my parents fell in love with her at first sight despite the fact that I literally ran away with a married woman and got her pregnant. I'm sure that right now you already hate me. You're imagining me as some idiot who wants to run away with your wife, or if you're already divorced, as the one who did it. In the back of your mind, you imagine emptying the entire magazine of your Glock into me after catching me having a night with her in your bed. In your righteous anger, you call me every possible obscenity, don't you? And if this were the whole story, I'd be with you. But before you send me to the final circle of hell, why don't you listen to my story? Why not walk a mile in my shoes before passing judgment? It won't hurt you, and it might open your eyes. I think I should start in the middle. My name is Barry Allen. A few years after our wedding, my wife Iris and I moved to a beautiful cul-de-sac. You've seen these before, the road leads to a dead end, and the houses are located in a circle. Ours was very beautiful. It was an average neighborhood, but well maintained by people who clearly cared about their property. Since there were only four houses in the cul-de-sac, everyone knew each other. In fact, everyone came to see us the day we moved in, to make sure we fit in. And from the very beginning, we did. For couples, in a couple of years, became more like extended family than just neighbors. Jay Garrick and his wife Aubrey were there, of course. Jay was the oldest of us. He was in his forties, tall and a little plump, with thinning hair, but he was a real man. The word around the area was that Jay was a reformed womanizer who met and married the woman of his dreams after only knowing her for a few days. Jay always said that no matter how many women you've dated, it's always special when you meet the one. Then there was Wallace West, whom we all called Wally, of course. Wally was short, a little plump, and wore big, thick glasses. He looked like the typical accountant that he was. Wally's wife Deborah was and I think still is, a school teacher, and a very good one. The last couple was Bart Allen, no relation, and his wife Christy. Bart and Christy both worked in sales, apparently meeting at a conference. 
They were also the only ones in the area who had children at that time. They had two kids, a boy and a girl, but the entire neighborhood essentially adopted them and used them to practice their parenting skills. We all got along great and would always have parties or get-togethers at one of the houses. Everything was perfect until a year after we moved in, when I noticed that, while Jay was still great, he had actually become my best friend, his wife Aubrey had turned into a real problem. This was an interesting topic of conversation for Wally and Bart. It hurt Jay because it seemed like she was treating her own husband just as badly as the rest of us. As a best friend, I had to listen to him complain and sound about how the nightlife had faded and how she barely wanted to talk to him, let alone have an intimate. For a former womanizer like Jay, I think he could handle her silence, but the lack of intim was killing him. The four of us men gathered to support Jay, eating pizza and drinking beer one Sunday while watching a football game. Football games were always watched at my house because I had a 60-inch 1080p plasma TV. The worst part about Aubrey's craziness was that she was, without a doubt, the hottest wife around. She looked exactly like that girl from Southern Charm, Shannon. She had the same reddish hair that fell over her shoulders, a thin waist, and such beautiful legs that seeing her in shorts or a skirt would be worth declaring a national holiday. Aubrey clearly made all our wives look worse by comparison, of course. The other wives were almost glad when she headed straight to Beachville. On the other hand, the men, as I already mentioned, gathered to console Jay. I suggested that maybe we did something at one of the parties to offend her or hurt her feelings. Perhaps we all laughed too hard at some joke about her. Jay rejected this idea. Wally thought that maybe she was going through an early hormonal change or her hormones were out of whack. We all looked at each other because we had no experience in this area, but damn, women were mysterious, even to the men who married them, so it was possible. Finally, Bart said what we were all really thinking, as hot as Aubrey was, she probably had an intim on the side. Jay loved her even though she was a pain, and his face just fell when Bart suggested that. We all vowed to help him through the crisis in any way possible. After the summit, Jay and I retired to my office. We went online and found a good private detective. We received weekly reports and videos. After two months of work, the detective quit. He said that as much as he loved taking Jay's money, he couldn't, in good conscience, continue. Jay paid for 24-hour surveillance for two months, and Aubrey never left the house without Jay. She also never hosted anyone unless Jay was home. She had to be the loneliest woman on the planet. In the meantime, we looked into information about hormonal imbalances, and it turned out that Aubrey, at 27 years old, was too young for this. So, with our two most promising theories debunked, and our ultimate male wisdom, the four of us simply declared Aubrey a mystery. I'm sure Jay was mostly relieved to find out she wasn't cheating on him. Now, I know what Jay should have done in the first place was just ask Aubrey what was wrong, but it never occurred to him, or any of us, for that matter. Even though we spent a lot of time together, we all had our own individual interests and hobbies. Wally and Bart loved to bowl and were in the same league. Jay loved to play golf and also loved going to the races. I had my Mustang. I was always tuning it or cleaning it, but I also loved to run. At 26, I was 5 feet 9 inches and weighed about 170 pounds. I was in very good shape from running and working out. Working out is just a part of me. I took it for granted that not everyone does it. My wife, Iris, on the other hand, is almost my exact opposite. Iris is 5 feet 1 inch, and she lies about her height. She tries to convince everyone that she is 5 feet 4 inches. She does this because if she were 5 feet 1 inch, her BMI would be slightly above normal. She can accept the fact that she is overweight, but the term obese is offensive to her. Personally, I don't care. I fell in love with Iris when we were in college, and she was a little chubby back then. Of course, her size had its advantages. Iris had incredible chest, in fifth place. No wonder Iris and I were always looking for secluded places to avoid charges of public indecency. If you had asked me before all this, I would have told you without a doubt that I prefer my slightly overweight but warm and caring wife to this icy beauty next door. At that time, I believed in only two things as immutable, the first is that my Mustang will outrun any car in the area, including Jay's Camaro, and second, that Iris loves me with all her heart. 
Although we met under questionable circumstances, I was confident that over the last four years of marriage and two years of friendship before that, we had proven to each other that we would always be together. In fact, Iris was the one who always said that only death could separate us, and then only until we were both gone. I believed her with all my heart and felt the same. But since I'm here telling you this story, obviously, we were both wrong. It was a typical autumn Sunday when everything went to hell. Sundays are my long run day. That morning, I told Iris that I was going to run 20 miles, which was my usual routine when training for a fall marathon. Unfortunately, I just didn't have 20 miles in me that day, so I decided to finish after 10. As I was walking back down our street and approaching my house, I saw Aubrey in her yard. I waved to her, and as expected, she pretended not to see me. I was sure she saw me and was just being a jerk, as usual. I felt sorry for Jay and wondered again how a good man like him could end up with such an evil woman. I always tried to be as kind to her as possible, hoping that one day she would change and become the woman she was when we first moved here. I ran up to my house and noticed that I could see into my living room as I walked onto the porch. Iris always told me to close the curtains, and apparently, when I was checking the weather before my run, I forgot to close them. It wouldn't have made any difference, they were so busy that they wouldn't have noticed me anyway. Iris and my best friend Jay, the good man that he was, were having intimate. Bart stood nearby, waiting his turn. I found it hard to believe what I was seeing. Then I heard a poisonous voice behind me. You're even worse than the rest. You get pleasure from watching them have a night with this society girl, Aubrey said. What kind of pervert are you? Why don't you come in and join the rest of the perverts? I turned to her, not knowing what to say. Obviously, words weren't needed. Oh my god, she said incredulously. You didn't know, did you? She grabbed my arm and tried to keep me from entering the house. I'm so sorry, Barry, she said. I thought you knew everything and were involved in this. How could I know? I said, shocked. Bart is there, and so is Wally. I also know that Christy knows because she and Bart love to switch partners. I just assumed that, you being this idiot's best friend and the husband of a woman of easy virtue, also knew about it. It makes sense when you think about it. I thought you were all switching partners. I have to get out of here, I said, unable to think of anything else. Without a word, I headed toward my garage. I pulled out my key fob from my tracksuit pocket and pressed the button to open the garage door. Aubrey kept pace with me. I remember that I kept a spare set of car keys in the garage, in a toolbox drawer. I grabbed the keys and started the car. The sound of the eight pulsating pistons was drowned out by the beating of my heart. I needed to leave the house as quickly as possible, so as not to kill someone. I just wanted to go. I didn't have a specific destination, I just had to go. I pulled the car out of the driveway, my eyes narrowed to slits with anger. The Mustang's engine was so loud that I almost didn't notice the side door of my house open as I drove by. The only thing I saw was Aubrey's long reddish hair flash as she raised her hands as if praying or pleading and looked at me through the window. She'd been a jerk to everyone in the area for over a year, but now it made sense. I pressed the button to unlock the door for her, and once she was in the car, we were off. When we left the driveway, I saw Iris come out of the house in a hastily put on robe, fluttering in the breeze. She looked straight at me and realized that I had seen her. I shifted from reverse to forward and drove away. For the first few minutes, neither Aubrey nor I said a word. She then diplomatically broke the silence. If you don't slow down, the only place we're going is jail, she said. I eased off the gas but still didn't say a word. I'm so sorry, Barry, she said again. I really thought you knew. You already said that, I replied, frustrated. But I'm confused. If you knew this was happening, why didn't you tell me? I explained that too, she replied sharply. I thought you knew and weren't on it. I guess you don't remember me very well from when we were friends, I said sharply. But I love my wife. There's no way I'd ever share her with anyone. Too bad she doesn't think so, Aubrey chuckled. Then, realizing her words could hurt me, she changed her tone. Barry, I didn't mean for it to sound the way it did, she said. I remember you were a really nice guy. Maybe I should have remembered that and at least tried. 
But when I first found out about all this, I was just as shocked and hurt as you are now. I love Jay with all my heart. I couldn't believe he could do this to me, especially after all the words and promises he gave me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw that she was upset and on the verge of tears. My stomach started growling, I had run too far without eating, and my legs were starting to go numb too. I pulled off the highway and started looking for a place to eat. I noticed the IHOP sign and headed there. I bought big breakfasts and coffee for both of us. We took them with us and went to the park that I had seen earlier. We sat down at a table overlooking the playground. Several small children hung on the swings or rode the slides, their carefree laughter filling the air. The sounds of their happiness and their attempts to impress their mothers created a joyful atmosphere. Only Aubrey and I remained indifferent to their joy. That's what I wanted, Aubrey said, nodding toward the mothers and their children. This is my dream. I have a house. All I need is a loving man and a child. I thought I had it all, she said. This is what I wanted when I was younger, I said. My timing was bad, and after meeting Iris, my priorities changed. She just looked at me, and for the first time in a year, I saw her smile. What sport did you participate in? She asked. Athletics, I said. I'm a long-distance runner now, but a few years ago in college, I ran five Burmese chats and ten Burmese chats. You're still in very good shape, she said. That's one of the things I've always admired about you. You're still young enough to try. I have a life now, I said quietly. And I've become too soft to devote my life to such hard training. Plus, there are certain household amenities that I simply cannot do without. There's also the practical side of things. Nobody even remembers American track and field athletes. While the Olympics are going on, we pay attention to athletics, but once the medals are handed out, we don't think about the sport until the next games in four years. And of course, there are steroids, I said. She laughed, but I didn't understand why. So here we are, two little sheep who gave up on our dreams and still ended up with the ones we thought loved us the most, but turned out to be cheaters, she laughed. At least you can laugh, I said. This is the worst day of my damn life. Sorry, but this is a good day for me, she said. I know you feel bad, but I finally have a friend. I finally have someone I can talk to about this. For the last year or so, I've kept it all to myself. I literally had no one I could talk to. So that's why you became. I began. She finished for me, yes, that's why. But why didn't you divorce him or leave him? I asked. And do what? Or where, she asked. Wherever you want, I said. You are beautiful. You can do whatever you want in life. And you're still only, what, 27 years old. You can do whatever you want. Barry, she said quietly, not everyone is the same. I have already done what I set out to do and apparently failed. Life is not all about looks, and not everyone wants the same thing. I don't have the same will as you. I've already told you, all I wanted was to be someone's wife and someone's mother. When I met Jay, I was 22 years old, a small town waitress with limited opportunities. I knew that Jay was a womanizer. I met many such men who passed through our city. I didn't fall in love with their words because I knew what I wanted from life. I also knew what I didn't want. I didn't want to be another notch on some man's belt. I wanted a man who would be devoted to me and to us. I wanted someone who would love only me, and I wanted to build a life and family with this man. I thought Jay was him. I made him wait a long time and promised to marry me before anything started. We didn't have a night until our wedding night, and that was the first time I went all the way. My life started out so damn good. She stopped talking and started eating her bacon. I loved watching how her mouth moved and how carefully she took a bite. And then you moved, she said. At first, everything was fine. We all got along and everything went well. I told Jay it was time to have a baby or four. I started asking Christy about it, and she told me to be careful what you wish for because having a baby is life-changing. I walked away from that conversation thinking she was the most selfish woman ever. I went home, and on the way, I saw Jay entering your house. He looked around as if to make sure no one saw him, and then entered. I wondered what was going on. 
I thought maybe you were planning something again, so I quietly followed him. When I looked into your house, I saw your wife with him. Well, you understand, she shook her head, and I saw tears in the corners of her eyes. I tried to do it for Jay, but apparently, I'm not very good at it, she said. And the things she allows him to do. Barry, I love this man so much, there was nothing I wouldn't do for him, but he didn't even give me a chance. Some of the things they do are just disgusting. Did you know what she lets him do to her? Um, no, I said. Do you do this too? She asked curiously. No, I'm just not into it, I said. I guess I'm a little old-fashioned, but it just doesn't seem cute to me. So I'm not alone, she said. But as stupid as it sounds, I would let him do it to me if he ever asked. I think there's also the fact that she allows him to be rough with her, and it's just disgusting. Maybe I'm old-fashioned too. Anyway, as soon as I saw it, I knew Jay was lying to me. He promised that his days as a cheater were over when he met me and that we would lead a good life together. The first few days, I was really hurt. Then I just decided to take revenge on him. I stopped having an intim with him, but I think I hurt myself more than he did because he still has your wife, and they've gotten even more disgusting since then. All I got was more anger and loneliness. I guess I'm just a stupid country girl, she said, because when I looked into Jay's eyes, I truly believed that he loved me and that he was serious about all those promises. I truly believed that I was the only one for him. I squeezed her hand, which somehow intertwined its thin fingers with mine. I think we should start a club for simpletons, I said. My situation is strikingly similar to yours. I met Iris in college. I was on the track team, and as I said, I was preparing for the Olympics. I tried everything to become better. I even tried training with other athletes. I thought cross-training with soccer players and sprinters would help me. I'd get their explosiveness and speed, and they'd get my stamina. It really worked, and I also made some friends who were much more popular than me. I was in one of my training buddies' dorms when I met Iris. They always had all sorts of girls hanging out with them. Some of them were very beautiful. These were the girls that normal guys just couldn't get. There were also those who were not very attractive. I really didn't understand then what a girl like Iris was doing there. It turned out that she was there to rehearse with some football players. We started talking, and I found her to be a very nice girl. Of course, I wasn't stupid enough to think that she was somehow untouched, but I liked her. One of my friends warned me about her, however. He told me to find myself a good girl because Iris was not for me. He said she started out as a tutor but was just as bad as the other women there, and because she was a bitter girl and not as pretty as some, she had to do a lot more to get guys' attention. He wasn't trying to hurt me, but as a friend, he felt I should know. I took his advice and didn't call Iris. I dated a few nice girls over the course of a year or so, they were just good girls. Most of them were more popular than Iris, and most of them were also more beautiful. They were all slimmer but none of them made me feel the way she did. I ran into her again the year I was about to graduate. I studied in the library, and she worked there. She walked over to my desk and introduced herself again. I told her she didn't need to do that or remind me where we met because I remembered her very well. She seemed shocked by this. I told her I could probably replay most of our conversation from that night, and she was even more shocked when I did. We sat there talking in the library until it closed and then went for coffee. She gave me her phone number again and told me not to wait another year before we saw each other again. I was really torn because on the one hand, she was a truly special woman, but on the other hand, I had been warned. I called her the next evening and we stayed on the phone for over an hour. Finally, she just asked me out. I think my hesitation told her something. She asked me straight out if I liked her, and I answered without hesitation that I really did. She said she really believed there was a spark between us. I told her I felt it too. She told me she was practically starving herself to lose weight, and I asked her why. She said most of the guys she knew didn't want to date big girls, but if I gave her a chance, she'd lose weight because she really thought we had something. I started laughing, and she hung up. I called her back right away, but she hung up again. She turned off her phone. So I left her 20 messages. The next evening, I went to the library and sat right in front of her counter. I told her I wasn't leaving until we talked. 
She was really angry, and I could see that she was just hurt, but she told me that she had a break at 9 o'clock in the evening and that I should come then. When we were talking on her break, she said I had 5 minutes because she didn't want to spend her entire break on me. I could say whatever I needed to say, but after that, I had to promise to leave her alone. I agreed, and she said she was giving me her speech about how I'm a good guy but don't date fat girls. Then I started laughing again. I could see tears in her eyes, so I grabbed her hand and told her I thought she was beautiful and really pretty as she was, and she didn't need to lose an ounce of weight for me. When she heard this, she just continued to give other reasons why other guys didn't want to date her. I said none of them were true. She suggested just meeting me in secret, we could always stay at my dorm or hers and make sure no one saw us together. I asked why we should do this. She told me not to worry about anyone seeing us together. Even if I wasn't worried about her weight, I was probably worried that some of my friends might see us. I just shook my head. I finally told her what my friend had warned me about. I explained to her that I was just looking for someone good who could be mine. I wasn't interested in anyone hanging out with the football team or anything like that. We had a long conversation, and she explained to me that she didn't really like it. The problem was that she was a healthy girl with a healthy intimate drive, and she had to take what she could get. Most guys didn't like her, her size was a big deterrent for them. A lot of people who liked her just had a night with her, took money from her, or used her in other ways. But a bad intimate life is better than no night life. She also said that she would prefer to be in an exclusive relationship with one man, but she didn't have anyone willing to accept her offer, so she took what she could get. We started dating, and after we graduated, we did all the normal things. We met each other's families, got engaged, started living together, and finally got married. We moved into the area and met the rest of you. Now, what? She asked. I mean, in my case, I enjoy torturing Jay but I have no idea what to do next. I think I was hoping he would understand that what he was doing was wrong and that it was ruining our marriage. But with your wife, he has an alternative and he takes advantage of it. He's essentially getting a cheap cleanup. I haven't decided exactly what to do yet, Aubrey, I said. I need to think. Sorry, but I am a man and in such a situation, there must be some kind of revenge. I can't just lie there and let it happen but I need to think about what I want to do. Just coming in and punching Jay in the face might satisfy me for a minute or two, but it's not what's going to make me happy in the long run. The same goes for the others, they have pretty much ruined most of my life. I wish I had never moved to this damn area. I said. She nodded. But at least we don't have to go through this alone, she said. We got back into my Mustang and began the journey home. Despite what I had been through, I couldn't help but notice that it was a really good day. The weather was sunny with a light, cool autumn breeze. After I had the opportunity to vent to Aubrey, I felt a little better. I was still in pain, but the severity of my rage had diminished. Now there was no danger that I would take a baseball bat and start hitting Jay or anyone else. I also started thinking about what I wanted to do. When we arrived at our house, it seemed like all eyes were on us. Bart and Christy were sitting on their porch and began talking animatedly as we drove by. Wally and Deborah were watching us too. Deb waved to us, and Wally turned away. He started walking toward my house as we passed. When we pulled up to my house, I saw Jay waiting on my porch. I pulled up the driveway and parked the car in the garage. Jay followed my car. I left, and so did Aubrey. Iris walked out the back door as soon as the garage door closed. Aubrey hugged me tightly and whispered in my ear that she would see me later. Jay's eyes narrowed, and his lips tightened when he saw the hug. I also noticed Wally heading toward my house. Barry, Iris said sadly. I ignored her and turned to Jay. Some of the rage I had swallowed resurfaced. Barry, I'm sorry, buddy, he began. We need to talk about this as adults and figure out how I can make amends. That was all he got to say before I hit him. Wally was shocked, and Iris stood in the driveway with her hand over her mouth. Barry, Jay said, I hope you feel better. I think I deserve it. We deserve everything, but we need to talk about it. When I got to the porch, I heard A.U. yell through the fence to Jay, who was still lying on the ground, Jay, are we out of tanning oil? Barry, 
please don't tell Deborah, Wally whined. I walked past him and entered the house. I headed into my living room and turned on the TV. I found one of the endless broadcasts before an NFL game, and although my eyes were on the screen, I wasn't watching. My mind was still focused on the plan to take revenge on my neighbors. I heard the door open, and Iris entered the room. Barry, honey, we need to talk about what happened, she said. Iris, I'm not in the mood for you or this whole damn thing right now, I snapped. Get out of this room before I hit you. Barry, hiding here won't solve the problem, she said. It may not. She stopped mid-sentence when I looked at her and walked out. Thirty minutes later, the doorbell rang. Iris answered, and someone knocked on my door. I didn't answer. A few minutes later, Bart came in carrying pizza. Where's everyone? He asked. It's almost game time. Bart, if you don't get out of here, I'll kick your fifth place, I snapped. Barry, we were wrong, he said. We should have talked to you about this a long time ago. It didn't mean anything to me. Our friendship means so much more to me, so to even the score, I agreed that you would spend time with Christy. I'm not sure if you know this, but Christy and I have an open marriage, and you like her. This way, we will be even. Bart, you have three seconds to get out of my house, I said. I don't want you or your wife to ever come near me again. Oh, I see you've already chosen someone else, he said. A good choice. I looked behind me to see what he was babbling about and saw Aubrey standing in the doorway with a plate of chocolate chip cookies. I came to watch football with you, she said, smiling. Jay is in our bathroom trying to ice his lip and find something to calm his stomach. She giggled as she said this. Bart looked at her as he passed by. He smiled at her as if he was about to say something, but her icy gaze froze him in place. She sat down on the couch next to me with a plate of cookies between us. When the game started, I asked her what she wanted to drink. Milk, please, she smiled. It goes great with cookies, but beer goes well with football. I objected. Okay then, get yourself one while you bring my milk, she laughed. When I returned to the room, Iris was there again. She was saying something to Aubrey, who ignored her. No glasses yet? Aubrey asked as I sat down. Which team is ours? Those guys in blue and silver are our Detroit Lions, I said. Barry, we live in California. Aren't there any teams from California? She asked. Well, there's the 49ers and the Raiders, I said. Then why is our team the Lions? She asked. Who are they playing with? Iris asked. I ignored her and turned to Aubrey. I attended the University of Michigan to get my degree there. I started rooting for the Lions when they were terrible. Now they are on the rise for the first time in 20 years. I've been with them for as long as I can remember. I looked straight at Iris and said, Loyalty is very important to me. I love the shape of them, Aubrey said. Who are they playing with? Iris asked again. They can't play against me. I snapped. Because you already did. You've been playing me like a fool for a long time. But Iris began. Why are you even here? I barked. I just want to watch the damn game in silence. Get out! But she, Iris began again. My friend is invited. Get out! For the next three and a half hours, Aubrey and I sat on my couch with our feet up and watched the game. The Lions beat the Cowboys, and Aubrey and I had a great time. When the game ended, with some time left before the post-game show began, Aubrey picked up the remote and said, It's my turn. She went into the on-demand menu and found a movie. Surprisingly, this was a film I had not yet seen, and to even greater surprise, it was a good movie, a relatively new film with Nicolas Cage called Drive Angry. It was a crazy movie but very action-packed and quite good. We were running low on cookies, and our drinks were empty. I went and got refills for both Aubrey and myself. As I walked to the kitchen, I noticed that Iris and all her accomplices were gathered in the living room. Barry, Iris said quietly. What? I barked. Are you going to have a night again? Well, don't worry, we'll turn on the surround sound and turn up the volume. You can just turn on the fan to get rid of the smell. 
Barry, your friends, and I would like to talk to you when the game is over, Iris said quietly. The game is already over. I'm watching a movie with the only friend I have left, and if you don't get your lovers out of my house, I'll shoot them all as soon as the movie ends. Besides, isn't it time for you to move all your things to another bedroom? Barry, I don't think we should talk about divorce until we've exhausted all other options, she said. I know I was wrong, but one mistake. I walked back into the room and sat down on the couch next to Aubrey. Jay still loves you, I told her. He was very quick to protect you. Maybe you can make your dream come true after all. Iris still loves you, she replied. When you brought me the milk, she told me to stay away from you or else. So, if our spouses still claim to love us, maybe we can both get what we want. I don't know about you, Barry, but I've had over a year to think about this. I think Jay, in his own way, really loves me. The problem is that if he can cheat on me so easily and for so long, then he doesn't love me the way I want to be loved. So, as the Van Halen song says, I need to dream another dream. This dream is over. It's the same with me, I said. I need to talk to a good lawyer to figure out how I can get out of this marriage with dignity and most of my assets. I usually believe in a 50-50 division of assets, but she destroyed our marriage single-handedly. There must be a punishment for this. We think very similarly, she chuckled. Do you like Van Halen? I asked. We both smiled. We got up when the movie ended so I could walk her home. On her porch, in front of Jay, Wally, and Bart, she hugged me tightly. Stay away from my wife, Jay hissed as I walked past him. What I did was wrong, but your fat fifth place wife came after me. Barry, you have to understand, I haven't had an intimate in a year, man. A whole damn year without night. So when I saw Iris. Jay, I snapped, turning to him. He retreated, remembering how I had just beaten him. Firstly, if, as you say, Iris was the one who came after you, and that justifies you, then the same can be said about me. Aubrey is lonely, she deserves a friend, and I intend to be one. Secondly, you really ruin everything, and it's your fault. You, Jay, ruin everything for everyone because you started this. Aubrey stopped having a night with you because she saw you with Iris, not the other way around. She knew about you all from the very beginning. If you hadn't interjected and started having intimate with my wife, we would still be friends. You basically exchanged your wife for mine. He looked down. He's the one who got me into this, Wally said. But it didn't look like you were putting up much of a fight because I saw it. And Wally, sooner or later, will get Deborah involved in this, so you better start making amends to her now, because I'm sure she'll divorce you when she finds out. So this is the plan? Jay asked. You want to swap wives? Because I will never agree to this. This is not a fair deal. Aubrey is the most beautiful woman I know. No, it's not fair. I will never agree. Guess what, dumbass, I said loudly. Until this morning, I thought the same thing. If you had just come and said, Barry, do you want to switch? I would have laughed in your face. Until this morning, I love my wife more than anyone in the world. There is no way I would ever agree to share or exchange her. But we can't always get what we want. You ruin my marriage, and it's only fair that you suffer too. You guys talk like it's something from the Stone Age, Bart said. Christy and I slept with others all the time, and we're still together. This was just an experiment to see if you liked it. Now we know you don't want to do this. So you guys make up with your spouses, then we make up as friends and forget everything. Okay, not good, I said. You and Christy don't have what I would call a marriage. You have something like business partners or maybe roommates. When we have a barbecue, you don't hug or kiss. You don't even talk about each other. You just share a house and sometimes have an intim when neither of you has someone else. Your marriage is pathetic. I really can't believe you offered her to me today to save our friendship or your fifth place. Think about it, it's like you sold it so I wouldn't be mad at you. Obviously, I'm more important to you than your own wife. This is more than a little abnormal. Until this morning, you guys were like brothers to me, but collectively you weren't as important to me as Iris. I lost four of the most important people in my life at the same time. But, Jay began. 
Enough with the bots, I said. You guys wanted to talk, we talked. From now on, don't ever tell me again that you destroyed my marriage. There is no forgiveness for that. So from now on, you will have to use someone else's house to have a night with her because if I see any of you near my house, I will shoot first and ask questions later. When I turned toward the house, I saw that Iris was listening. As soon as I entered, she followed me, tears in her eyes. Barry, you gave them a chance to talk. I want mine, she said. I sat down on the steps and looked at her. I think it's better now than after we get lawyers involved, I said. Barry, I'm not going to make excuses for what I did, she said. I was stupid. I was wrong, and to be honest, I never expected you to catch me or find out. It was just a night and just for fun. You knew what kind of woman I was when we started dating. Maybe I embellished it a little to try to convince you otherwise, but you knew that I was a woman of easy virtue. I didn't start this way, but that's how the circumstances turn out. We have been together for six years and married for four years. This is the first time I've done something like this. Don't I deserve another chance? I promise you that this will never happen again. Barry, you've always had the freedom to choose who you want and go after them. For most of my life, I have always been a chubby girl. I had to open up to be noticed, and even then, I wasn't noticed the way I wanted. So yes, when you met me and your friend warned you about me, he was telling the truth. I would hang out at the football players' dorms, and a lot of these guys would just have a night with me whenever they felt like it. Most of them could then go out and act like gentlemen with the women they really wanted. Or if they came home after going out and didn't get anything, I was there. Sometimes I was there for two or three of them at the same time. This was not what I wanted. No girl I know ever grows up dreaming of being a prostitute. Men make us like this. We all start out dreaming of a fairy tale, but most of us don't achieve it. Even doing what I did, I was still special. I was still a good girl in my head. Then you came along and made me want to be a really good girl again. Barry, you made me stop all this. You are everything I have ever dreamed of and more. You always made me feel special. I always knew how much you loved me, and you continue to confirm it. Your words about how you would never trade me for Aubrey or anyone else made me realize again how much you truly love me and how much I have to lose. For a while before we moved here, it was just you and me against the world. There was no one I could regularly compare myself to, and then we moved here and became part of the area. There are only four couples here, and again I was the fattest. When we had barbecues or parties, no matter what I wore or how hard I tried to look my best, I was always the most unattractive, and I wanted people to pay attention to me too. Jay is a real liar and womanizer. He started flirting with me a long time ago. All he really wanted was to get to my breasts, so I started playing this game. I started flirting back and letting him glance at them. I know I shouldn't have done this, but damn it, Barry, I'm human too. I want to be wanted too. After all, he came one day when you were not at home. He probably got me a little more drunk than I should have been allowed, but we ended up having an intimate. A few days after that, Aubrey stopped talking to me, and him too. Wally and Bart got into it, and they all started using me to try things they'd heard about but never done. For me, it was like going back to my student days, only this time I had the best of both worlds. On one hand, I had you, who loved me, praised me, and made me feel cared for. On the other hand, it felt as if I didn't have to give up what I was getting in college. Until this started, I thought I couldn't have it both ways, and when I thought that, I chose you. Always remember this, Barry, I chose you. But the last year has taught me that, as Bart and Christy say, there's no reason I can't have it both ways. Until this morning, you loved me and thought I was special. The way you look at me now hurts me more than anything, you look at me like I'm a piece of garbage. I didn't do anything today that I haven't done in a long time. The only thing that has changed is the way you think about me now, and it hurts. I'd really like you to think about this, I will always put you first, but I like it when they want me. Again, our marriage will always come first. However, this is something I would like to explore. Maybe you'll even join. But Barry, if you say no, I'll stop this immediately. I don't want a divorce, I want us to be together forever. I want us to grow old, visit our grandchildren, and do all those silly things. 
I don't care what you want, Iris, I said. I can barely look at you now. I want to hit you as you stand here. I don't even see you as a woman, let alone my wife. But to answer your question, do what you want. Our marriage cannot be saved. I'm not giving you permission to do this, but you're a grown woman, you don't need my permission. However, I will never have a night with you again. Barry, that's not what you mean, she said. I will stop, I swear. I'll make an appointment with a marriage counselor. Please, Barry, give me another chance. It was brilliant, this whole counseling thing would have given me time to put my plan into action. Okay, I said, maybe counseling will help us. I'll start moving back into our room. She smiled. No, I said, more harshly than I intended. Maybe if we get through this, but not until then. Barry, this could take weeks, maybe even months, she whined. So what? I snapped. It may also not work at all. I don't make any promises. We can still get divorced. You brought us to this point. You had a choice between being the wife I loved and adored or just being some fat woman of easy virtue. In my opinion, you chose the wrong one. And listening to your lovers talk about you, are you sure it was worth it? But Barry, can't we just sleep together? We don't have to have an intimate, I just need to be close to you, she whined. But I can't be around you, I said. The next morning, I woke up and immediately noticed that I was alone in my bed. At first, I missed having Iris around, and the sadness was almost unbearable until I reminded myself why I was alone. I got dressed and went down to the kitchen. Iris was there preparing breakfast, wearing one of my favorite nightgowns. She turned around as if she hadn't noticed me entering the kitchen. I laughed inside, her actions and motives were very clear. I wondered when she became so manipulative. Apparently, she was no longer the wonderful, simple-minded woman I had fallen in love with. Perhaps that wasn't the case, perhaps she had always been like this, and I was just too blind to see it. I laughed again, this time out loud, but now I was laughing at myself. What's so funny, dear, she smiled. Is it something I did or maybe something you saw? That's not what you did, I said, trying really hard not to look at things after what I saw yesterday. She winced at my words but tried again. I took an apple from the counter and she looked at me suspiciously. So, will you tell me what you laughed at? She asked. I could use a good laugh too. I just thought that if you had come downstairs like that last week, I probably wouldn't have gone to work at all, I said. She smiled upon hearing this. It's not that funny, she said. I think it's very nice. The funny thing is that you think I'll buy it now. I laughed as I took my briefcase and headed toward the door. Don't you want to have breakfast? She asked. I thought we could talk. I have no appetite, I said. Well, you're early. Can we talk anyway? She asked. I think we've said all I can bear yesterday, I replied. But I had a lot of time to think last night, she said. And I changed my mind on some things. As she said this, she stood right in front of me, showing almost a foot of plunging cleavage. I smiled and walked around her. Barry, we can't get through this if we don't talk, she said. I'm not sure I want to get over this at all, I replied. Sorry if I don't act like the version of me in your head when you thought about it, but I'm a real person. I have my own needs and feelings, and I must act accordingly. So maybe you should stop trying to predict how I'll behave. I won't be so easily manipulated anymore. Barry, I don't want to manipulate you. I just want to atone for my guilt. I just want us to talk about this. You won't make it until we overcome the pain. We could always talk about everything. Besides being married, we were best friends. Last night was the worst night of my life. I'm starting to realize how much I've hurt you with my dishonesty. I want to make things right so we can move on, she said. I put down my briefcase and apple and turned to her. Then I started clapping my hands. Great speech, I said. You must have rehearsed it for hours. But Iris, this is not something you can just get over. There's no ticking clock here. It may take me a few weeks before I want to see you again. It may be months before I can sit down and talk to you without feeling like I'm going to throw up, or I could just come home today and put a stack of divorce papers in your hands. I don't know. 
Judging by what you said yesterday, this is what you got used to back in college. I thought what we were doing was much more special. I really thought there was something magical between us. Now I see that I'm just another name on your list. I may be the one paying for it all, but at the end of the day, I'm just one of your lovers. And I'm the dumbest because not only am I the only one who didn't realize it was just a night, I'm the only one who was dumb enough to love you and think you were special. But, she began. No buts, Iris, I said. You tore my heart out. Now I have to learn to reevaluate everything I thought I knew. This is a whole new world for me. I have to reassess everything I see and do. I'm like a baby starting all over again from scratch. Believe me, there will be big changes. But Barry, I already told you, she began again. Iris, you no longer have the right to talk nonsense to me, I snapped, my tone becoming angrier with every minute of our conversation. Barry, nothing has changed, she said softly. I still love you with all my heart. I just slipped up. Barry, I am human. I didn't do anything criminal, I just broke the rules by which we live. I was also dishonest with you. By doing this, it's like your damn football games. One team violates the rules of the game and receives a penalty, they move the ball halfway to the target and try again. After a few games, this is forgotten. The main thing is that both teams want to win the damn game. I love you, Barry. I love you, and you are hurting now, but you love me too. It would be foolish to throw away everything we've built because of one rule violation. Give me a penalty so we can get through this. Nothing has changed, we are still the same people. There is nothing we cannot overcome. Another great and passionate speech, I said. This time, you even managed to use football. But again, you're wrong, Iris. Now I see everything differently. My job is different now. I'm going to the same damn building and doing the same damn things, but this is different because I used to go out there and bust my fifth place to be successful and provide for us so that you could have good things and we could do what we wanted. But now I'm not sure it matters. So why should I bust my fifth place? And if I do, why the hell should it be for you? I looked at her, and she almost stepped back. I need to look at everything again, Iris. Since I graduated from college, everything I have seen has been viewed in terms of how it fits into our lives. It was all about us. But if we are not there, then everything needs to be reevaluated. It's different. You are a different person than I thought. It's like my Iris died leaving you in her place, and I'm not sure I want you. Iris staggered to the table and sat down heavily. This is not just breaking the rules in some cosmic football game. What you did was not a violation or a misdemeanor, it was a devaluation, perhaps even an annulment, not of the rules of the game, but of our marriage. What you did completely ended our marriage. The reasons we got married simply weren't what I thought they were. Perhaps they never were. So the question remains, why are we married? Iris lowered her head to the table. You tried to be mature and adult about all of this. I respect you for this, but you said several times that you didn't really do anything wrong. It's like you think the only bad thing about this is that you didn't check with me before you went and started having an intim with our neighbors. I totally agree with you that a woman has the right to do whatever she wants with her body. But when we got married, we both agreed to follow certain rules. I think the priest called them vows. If you didn't believe in them, why did you bother with them? Find us a therapist quickly, Iris. If you don't, we might not need one. I took my briefcase and left. Work went without incident. I was looking through my files and found the number of an attorney I worked with who represented one of the wealthiest businessmen in our state. He was recently in the news because one of his deals fell through. He tried to build a shopping center next to a nice suburban area and was nearly tarred and feathered by neighborhood groups, environmentalists, and small business groups. I have an idea. I asked the lawyer to contact his boss. I didn't tell him what it was about, but I hoped his boss remembered me well enough to agree to the meeting. I also made an appointment with the best divorce lawyer I could find. This guy was like napalm. Judging by his reputation, it spread throughout the entire divorce and burned everything it touched. A few hours later, I finished work for the day. For the first time in my memory, I didn't want to go home. What was left for me? 
I thought about going to a bar with the guys from work but decided to put it off for at least one day. I would need to start developing new friendships, but I could start that tomorrow. I parked in the driveway and turned off the Mustang's ignition. I entered the house as quietly as I could, put my briefcase down, and sat on the sofa in the living room. I exhaled all the air I had been holding and tried to release all the tension with it. I closed my eyes and focused on just relaxing. I think I almost dozed off when I felt a pair of soft hands start massaging my shoulders. It was divine. Get your damn hands off me, I said in the coldest voice I could muster. I abruptly stood up from the sofa and looked at the pain written on Iris's face. I was just trying to make you feel better, she said, gathering her courage. You look like you had a hard day at work. Iris, my day at work was normal. This homecoming created all the tension, I replied. She lowered her eyes. When do you want to have dinner? She asked. I'm not sure if you want to wait until you've run or if you want something before then. Iris, just cook what you like when you want it, I said. Isn't that how you looked at our marriage? I went upstairs and changed into light sweatpants and a light hoodie. I put on my favorite sneakers and headed outside. Iris watched me as I left the house. Be careful, she said quietly. I pretended I didn't hear her. As soon as I stepped out onto the porch, Aubrey appeared. She smiled at me and came over. Your run today is going to be terrible, she said. I know, I replied. Usually, my runs on Mondays were just to get the blood flowing in my legs again after a long run on Sunday. On Mondays, I was usually stiff, so I ran slowly and leisurely. That's not what I'm talking about, she said, still smiling. You will run even slower than usual and perhaps even walk. I looked at her funny because I was kind of an exercise snob. I always waved to other runners along the way but barely noticed the walkers. The thought of walking on my own seemed absurd, but she looked at me and smiled, and her smile seemed to take away some of the anger I was holding inside. Okay, why would I do this? I asked. Because I'm coming with you, she said. Let's go. So we started running. I noticed Jay was in his doorway as we ran, and I also noticed that all the eyes on the street were on us. Again, as we slowly, God, so slowly, ran down the street, I was sure that if we had run any slower, we would have gone backward. But I stuck it out, the smile on her face was reward enough to overcome any disappointment at our slow speed. Jay wanted to talk to you again today, she said. He thought you'd had enough time to calm down and that now maybe you'd be ready to talk. We walked side by side, and the pace was fast for walking, but she managed well. Bart convinced him to wait a few days before approaching you again. He said you are in a lot of pain, and it will take time. Plus, they all remember how you said that the next time they came to your house, you would shoot them. She smiled again, and I noticed that she was still holding my hand. Do you have a gun? She asked. Of course, I said. It was my father's gun. He worked in army intelligence, he got it while hunting down spies. It's a pretty big gun. Which one? She asked. Well, it's kind of rare. I don't think they make them anymore. Is this one of those old long-barreled .38s? She asked. No, it's a .45, I said. Probably the most powerful .45 I've ever shot. When you hit something with this gun, it doesn't just make a hole, things explode. Is this a CT-45? She asked. No, this is an automatic pistol designed specifically for the US government, I said. This is one of those custom federal designer samples that were issued to intelligence operators. Stories have been written about them. What do you think of the first part of the story? In my opinion, the story was quite impressive, but at the same time very interesting, because it is not something you hear every day. What is your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the next video.